Hey everyone, Dr. Bernard here. This is an interview with Jill Hamer Wilson, who is a stage four lung cancer survivor. In the description below, I've linked her blog and also different organizations that help support and fund lung cancer research. Jill, thank you so much for the time for the interview. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Well, I live in Ottawa, Canada. That's a good place to start, where it's um, still kind of chilly. It's February. I always lived a really healthy life, uh, really fit played a lot of sports. I used to canoe competitively, ate really healthy, and I thought I was doing everything I could to avoid cancer. I didn't expect it, and so when I had a cough with a cold that didn't go away, didn't really think much of it. A lot of people in the schoolyard, a lot of other parents and kids were having the same cough, and I was hanging out there a lot with my kids who were, at the time, they were 6, 10, and 12. You know, about three weeks of this coughing when I realized my cough wasn't getting better. In fact, I thought maybe it was getting worse. I went to the doctor and got a chest x-ray. The doctor didn't even suspect lung cancer, and I had no idea. I mean, I, I just didn't think it was possible for me to get lung cancer because of the, the associations with smoking and because I had never smoked. It just didn't, wasn't on the radar. And it should have been because... Anyone can get lung cancer. I didn't know it at the time, but anyone can. And um, obviously, no one deserves it. So it took a while before I was actually diagnosed. I was diagnosed in December of 2013. I started on chemotherapy, and then they did biomarker testing. And I had um, a particular kind of lung cancer that I could take a pill form of treatment for. So after chemotherapy, I started on the pills. The thing with those is that they tend to work really well, but usually only for a matter of months or years. So after, um, you know, a number of months or years, I had to switch to a different pill and then another one after that. And it was kind of a roller coaster ride up and down because there weren't always treatments available. In fact, several times I went to my oncologist and I said, so if I were to suffer progression, what would my option be? And he said, oh, we don't really have anything for you. You could try chemo again. Then the very next appointment after that, when I went in, found out that, that I had progression and that, in fact, in that short window of time, there had been another treatment that became available. So I really feel like I had this roller coaster ride of up and down and I've got to tell you a, a clinical trial saved my life. One of those times there were no treatments available except through the clinical trial. That was such a great privilege and opportunity. The care that um, people receive on clinical trials is just amazing. I had extra tests done and really personalized care where people met and asked about all my side effects and how I was feeling and they really watched over me. On that clinical trial I actually had really good results and it kept me alive for a couple of years. And then that was long enough, again, for more treatments to be available. So I'm really thankful to be here, alive, more than seven years after my diagnosis. And my kids are all now so much taller and older. My youngest, who was six when I was diagnosed, she's 14 now. And my boys, who are 10 and 12, are now 17 and 20. My oldest is a university student. You had mentioned that there was a couple months in between the time that you had this cough and the diagnosis. And I just wanted to ask you, what was that time like? And what, what were you feeling around that time? So in between my coughing and my diagnosis was a very challenging time. My cough was growing progressively worse, and I went back to the doctor several times, but I was just prescribed puffers, which were not working. And I kept going back saying the puffer isn't working. There was nothing else offered to me for some time. My own family doctor was actually on sabbatical, and someone was filling in for her. And I was so thankful when one of the times when I went back, a different doctor saw me. She looked at my chest x-ray again, and she was the one who got the ball rolling to investigate lung cancer. So I'm really thankful that she considered that as a possibility. The chest x-ray that I had done in early October apparently gave some signs of lung cancer. 
but the first doctor didn't pick up on that for some reason. And I'm guessing I never got to ask her. I didn't see her after probably October or November. I'm guessing she just didn't consider lung cancer. You know, a younger woman, really fit and healthy. It's just not on the radar of a lot of primary care physicians. That's definitely the case for a lot of people who um, become cancer patients at a younger age where the risk factors almost just aren't there at all, right? And so, you know, one of the worst things that can happen is if somebody goes to the emergency room is, and is diagnosed with cancer, because usually by then, that just means that it's so obvious that somebody who doesn't typically diagnose cancer can immediately identify that it's cancer. Uh, or if not immediately, then, you know, within a couple of steps in terms of thinking, they can deduce that this is very likely cancer. And so that makes the diagnosis very difficult. And so in between those couple of months and then up to the day of the diagnosis, what was the experience when you were told that you had cancer? It was so shocking. You know, I'm someone who eats a lot of blueberries and broccoli and you know I tried to eat all the all the right things all those superfoods and um, cancer just wasn't on my radar I, I mean I guess I thought it was a possibility but I never thought lung cancer was a possibility because I thought that you needed to smoke or be exposed to radon or other toxic chemicals and to my knowledge, I had not been exposed to any of those toxic chemicals. I had no idea that there were other, that there were people who got lung cancer for no known reason. And there are so many of us, I've met hundreds of people who were diagnosed with lung cancer who just were not expecting it, were completely blindsided by that. And it's devastating, right? Like, you know, I was young with young kids and knowing that people with lung cancer don't tend to have a good prognosis. I mean, anyone with a stage four diagnosis, it's not a good outlook. And being a mom who really wanted to be there for her kids. And, you know, I had, I had a lot of other plans in life that I wanted to accomplish as well. And it was just so shocking and just very, very sad and frightening. And, you know, we were thrust into this world with all this vocabulary that we had to learn. I'd never been unhealthy really before, so being in a hospital and just navigating just all of the procedures and everything was really challenging to learn. And there aren't a lot of supports. I'm, I'm not, I know it varies from place to place, but generally lung cancer does not have a lot of support networks in place. So when I was diagnosed, I looked in my cancer center for you know, a brochure or a booklet, something to help me navigate. And there was nothing. There was, you know, there were a lot of pamphlets. There were racks, displays with tons and tons of pamphlets for other kinds of cancers. And to me at that time, it looked like every kind of cancer. Um, but, um, but nothing for lung cancer. All there was was um, some smoking cessation information, which if you need that and you're interested in, in that, that's great. But um, for someone like me who was just looking for some help, I felt very abandoned and that was really difficult. I felt very alone. What changed in your life when that diagnosis was issued? I was given the option of chemotherapy or the pill but the pill cost $10,000 a month. And I was busy trying to track down my insurance to see if they would cover it. Things are a little different in Canada than the United States. But I had some insurance through my previous employer. I didn't hear back from them, so we went ahead with the chemotherapy. So I was diagnosed on a Thursday. On the weekend, we told the kids because, anyway... That was the hardest conversation probably of my life. And then I started chemo on Tuesday. So suddenly we were thrust into this whirlwind where we had no idea what, you know, how I was going to respond to chemo. How sick would I be from the chemo? 
would it work to help me feel better? Because at the time I was, I was coughing constantly. I couldn't even get a sentence out or even half a sentence usually without coughing. And I was so exhausted from all of that. I had, I remember I had friends come over to be with me when I got home from chemo because my kids were young and I didn't want to be alone in the house with them if I was really, really sick. I wanted someone to be there to, you know, help support my kids, just make sure that all their needs were met. So, you know, friends took me to chemo and brought me home and stayed with the kids and cooked dinner. And, and as it turned out, I managed it all right. I wasn't too, too sick and didn't need all the support that I had planned for, but I was just really glad that my kids were cared for well and had so much support from friends who brought us meals and came over during a birthday party. My daughter's birthday party happened while I was doing chemo and a dear friend came over and just helped kind of corral six-year-olds. <laughs> so, um, yeah, really grateful. Could not have done it without the support of, of our community. What was the experience like being on that treatment? Because one of the things that you had mentioned was you were on a pill. And so what was it like being on that pill? Right. So I've actually been on uh, four different kinds of pills, and each one has a different side effect profile. And obviously the side effects vary from person to person. But I can tell you that compared to the chemo, it's night and day. Even the worst of the pills was better than chemo. Chemo just kind of knocks the stuffing out of you. And yeah, it was really, really hard on, on my body. And, you know, I was like, I'd wake up in the middle of the night sweating and it was just awful. It was really, really hard. But the pills, although some of them have some different side effects that aren't necessarily that pleasant, it's nothing compared to chemo. So if you get the opportunity to go on these pills, the targeted therapy, I would definitely encourage you to give them a try, much better than chemo. A lot of people who are on the pill form of therapy, they continue working full time. Not everyone's able to do that, but some are. And so you were on chemo first, then the pills? Yes. And then you had mentioned for a time those pills worked, but then you had mentioned progression. And then they had said, you might need to go back on chemo again. And so what was that experience like? And what's the time frame that we're looking at? If you had a diagnosis in late 2013, and then you went from chemo to the targeted therapy pills, and then progression, what's the time frame that we're looking at? Um, for me, it's generally, I mean, each one's been a different amount of time, but generally just under two years, usually. What prompted doctors to look through and see if there was progression? They're just routine tests that are done. Once you're in the system, you get regular CT scans, three or four months for us, um, and may vary in different places. I know in the United States, a lot of people get PET scans too. Um, that's not been my experience. I just had one initially a diagnosis, and since then CT scans, and the occasional brain MRI. Had a bone scan once, I think, too. Just routine CT scans every three to four months. That's the thing with the lungs, that there can be quite a lot of progression and you don't necessarily feel it. I've heard so many stories from different people about being diagnosed and they had no idea. Um, maybe they had just a little shortness of breath or maybe not even any discernible symptoms. A lot of people were diagnosed when they were being tested for something else or, you know, had um, just a routine CT scan after a car crash and the lung cancer was found. So lung cancer is really sneaky and you can't always tell by how you're feeling how the lung cancer is doing. So what was the experience like when they told you you had progression? Well, I knew it was coming because uh, these drugs don't last forever. But of 
course, it's always really sad. It's disappointing. One would always hope for longer on them. You know, it's a much better feeling when you know there are other drugs in the pipeline that you might be able to take. Once you know that there aren't any more coming, you don't have as many days left as you once did. Well, maybe that's silly because none of us do. None of us know how long we have. But it's a sign every time you switch to a new drug. It's a reminder that um, you don't know how much longer you have, but it's not as long as it was before. <laughs> And so did you go back on the chemotherapy at that progression? No, I never did go back on the chemo. I was able to transition smoothly from one pill to another once I started on one. So after the progression, you started taking a, a different targeted therapy pill. What was that experience like? Yeah, well, with each pill I took, within a matter of sometimes even days, I could feel the difference. My symptoms, usually by the time, so you'd usually take, um, you know, a couple of weeks to make the transition to the next pill, during which time my symptoms would tend to get worse. Um, often I was coughing, that would start and really quickly get a lot worse. Um, but when I would start on the pill, I would feel better quite quickly. And it was just amazing the difference that they made so fast. Where are we now in terms of your, your journey uh, with the diagnosis? Well, after the clinical trial, um, thankfully there was another drug that was available to me and I worked really well for a couple of years and then it didn't. And I switched to another drug that worked really well for a couple of years and then it stopped working quite so well. So now I'm I actually last fall um, I had some progression and we tried radiation. So I did five days in a row of radiation and unfortunately that didn't work as well as we had hoped it would. So I had to start chemotherapy after that because I was doing very very poorly. And the, so I've been on chemotherapy since November, as well as the targeted therapy, which my oncologist doesn't think is probably doing much good, but I think it might be. And there are some trials now where people are combining chemotherapy plus a targeted therapy. And I live in hope. And so uh, as long as I can manage the side effects from both treatments, I'm doing them both. And so far, so good. Yeah, I was going to ask, how are you feeling now? Yeah, so I'm, you can probably tell from my, my the sound of my voice and my breathing that I'm not 100%, that's for sure. I have to work hard to breathe, even just to talk. But I'm getting better. I'm way better now than I was, you know, in October or November. Um... Those were really, really difficult days. So definitely the chemotherapy is working. I'm definitely feeling better. And I'm feeling a little bit better every day. So I'm very hopeful. What would you tell people who are in that couple month period where, you know, they have some trouble breathing, but there isn't a diagnosis yet, but they might be thinking that there is a diagnosis coming from your own experience? What advice would you give to somebody in that position? Well, I would say uh, ask your doctor for, um, for more testing. Ask for a chest x-ray, ask for a CT scan. And if your doctor isn't listening to you, look for another doctor who will listen to you because this really matters. When you're being diagnosed, biomarker testing is so important because it's not enough to just say you have lung cancer. It really matters to know the specific kind of lung cancer that you have. And that doesn't just mean, like it used to, just be non-small cell or small cell. It's much more distinct than that now. Now we've divided up, if you think about a pie chart, 
We've divided up both of those into different segments, and we know how to treat many of those segments with specific targeted medication now. So you wanna have the right treatment, and to get the right treatment, you need to know your particular kind of lung cancer. So if you're being diagnosed with lung cancer, ask for more specifics. Ask what kind of lung cancer you have. And ask about clinical trials too, because so many of these new treatments are only available through clinical trial, no matter which country you're in. Um, so sometimes, as sad as it is, we have to advocate for ourselves. And that can be the beginning of an advocacy journey for many people. Yeah, can you tell me more about this advocacy? Where are some resources that patients can reach out to? Well, thanks for asking. There are lots of resources. Uh, if you are in the United States, there's the Longevity Foundation. It's spelled like longevity, but with the word lung in it. Longevity. They have lots of great resources, as well as an annual summit, which if it weren't for COVID, it would be happening um, in April in Washington, D.C. There's also a GoTo Foundation, which has an online support group called The Living Room. There are lots of other organizations in, you know, regionally too, so have a look for them. In Canada, there's Lung Cancer Canada that does offer some support. They have a great patient guide that they'll send to you or that you can find online. I see a white ribbon in your background. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? I would love to. I've got one here too, but I'll, I'll let you just look at the one in the background. So this is uh, the White Ribbon Project, which just started recently in October. A lung cancer survivor in Colorado her name's Heidi. She was asking her cancer center, what are you doing for Lung Cancer Awareness Month? And she was really frustrated and disappointed with their result, uh, their answer. What she did was she asked her husband, who had just started woodworking as a hobby. He's actually a, a primary care physician. And they both have master's degrees in like public health and health education. So they're really well educated in Heidi's like a fitness instructor. They're so, anyway, they're great people. They're really nice too. So Heidi was feeling frustrated. She asked Pierre to make her a wooden ribbon. And this is what he did. It was just to hang on their door. But uh, the neighbors started asking about it and asking, would Pierre make me one too? And more and more people started talking about it. And, and it's a great conversation starter. So before you knew it, they were making all kinds of ribbons for people and not just giving them out to their neighbors, but actually sending them to people all over. Well, first the United States, and then in December, the first one arrived here in Canada. They've now made over 550 white ribbons. And not just them, but other people have started making them. So there's this lovely couple here in Canada named Lisa and Bill. They've made if you can believe this, over 200 white ribbons, and they've been distributed in nine out of 10 of our provinces, and even in one territory as well. So that's really great news. There are people all over the country now here in Canada, as well as the United States, who are taking pictures with their ribbons at local landmarks, or taking them into their cancer centers, they're asking their oncologists or other people, all kinds of people, to take their pictures with them. And the movement's really spreading. It's helping to um, increase dialogue about all kinds of things, including early detection, the importance of low-dose CT scanning. And um, we're really about research. Research matters. We share the message that anyone can get lung cancer and no one deserves it. We value uh, love and gratitude. We're an inclusive movement, an unbranded grassroots advocacy movement. And it's really growing quickly. You know, you're not alone. 
So when you're diagnosed, you might feel really alone and lung cancer can be very lonely. But this white ribbon project, it's, it's really bringing people together and communicating that we're not alone. You're not alone. Thank you so much for the time for the interview. For the people who are listening, where can they find you? Well, I blog at throughthevalley.ca. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, a little bit on Instagram. And um, I think I'll be on your YouTube channel, right? So maybe we can post that. Can you post that, those links? Definitely. I'm going to post the links to all of your contact um, and your blog and your social media, as well as all of the advocacy groups in there. And we'll be able to connect more people together. It's all about team, right? And together we can make a real difference. So thank you for talking about lung cancer today. Really appreciate that. Definitely. Thank you so much for your time, Jill. Thank you.